Good morning, everyone. Uh, it is uh, so wonderful to have everybody together this morning for a, a member meeting of Central Houston here on a beautiful morning. Uh, I dearly miss uh, seeing you all in person and us being together, but I think we've, we're learning that. If I haven't met you, I'm Bob Urie. I'm the president and CEO of Central Houston. Uh, and it, uh, again, it's just a joy to have you with us. And I wanna thank, to start by just saying thank you, the members, you the members, for being with us in this time uh, of COVID. Uh, this has been quite a year. You've heard it said so many times and we're not done yet. We'll keep saying this for quite a while, I'm afraid. Uh, but your support has been so appreciated. Uh, and so you folks on the screen here uh, really have just been everything to us to keep us going and, and, and uh, really help the organization go forward because we've had, in spite of COVID, an amazingly productive year. So um, we're thrilled today to focus on transit. And uh, I wanted to, uh, it, it, it's one of the key priorities of the organization. And uh, you know, when it, you get down to it, um, Central Houston and Metro uh, are, are like, um, almost like siblings. Um, Metro went operational in 1979. Central Houston went operational in 1983. We have been together through a tremendous development of this city, and certainly a metro with a, a development of a, a, a huge transit system. Uh, and we've been through multiple referenda together. We've been through many, many capital projects and service concepts and changes. And frankly, I just, I view Metro as family, frankly. So we're thrilled today to have both uh, uh, Karin Patman, uh, chair of Metro, and also Tom Lambert, the uh, CEO with us. But I. I want to just take just a second uh, and um, really kind of give you some idea of, uh, of why transit's so important. First of all, I just want to say that downtown still is the largest place of employment in our region. We have 168,000 employees, and we also have the most businesses located here that, that we have in the region. And the thing that makes downtown really unusual is, is that we have... Um, a tremendous use of multiple modes of transit, uh, transportation uh, to commute, but at least about a third of that, depicted in green here on this pie chart, is, is metro. And um, there's no other place in the region like this. And uh, quite frankly, I don't know what we would do without it. I mean, it is so incredibly important. Um, and what, what I think as we look at where we are now with COVID, I want, uh, uh, I want to look at uh, this, this chart here kind of shows the distribution of where employees in downtown live. And as you can see, quite a few employees live more than 10 miles away from downtown. And that percentage of those using transit goes way up when you get into that. So it, somewhere around 40% of the workers in downtown are using transit uh, in anything over 10 miles. And so, it's extremely, that's about an average and it varies a little bit by distance. But uh, I, think, I think that gives you some idea of why it's so incredibly important and Metro's so incredibly important to us in downtown. And we're sort of locked together in, with COVID in this rather difficult situation of uh, how does transit work? And uh, Metro's working to make things safe and really kind of make it work and the chair will tell you more about it. But the other thing we're doing is trying to work, and some of you have been participating in surveys we've been doing really jointly with Metro uh, to try to find out kind of what's the future in weeks ahead about how's the workforce coming back. And of course, as you know, and I know, it's taken a lot longer than any of us thought. And it looks like at this point, just from the recent survey that, you know, the decisions on much of this is not necessarily local, even though it's the largest on this bar chart but there are a lot of other factors about how and where decisions are made about how we will return. And I think we're all kind of at a point now where it'll probably be, we'll have to have a vaccine pretty broadly distributed before we'll begin to begin to see any normalcy. So we've got a job ahead because we've got to work together to think how we're going to, you know, how, how things come back up. And Metro to us right now is probably more critical than it's ever been. So with that, um, I want to, uh, 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 it's, an honor to turn it over to Karen, uh, who is a Cracker Jack lawyer, but she's also a veteran board member of, of Metro because she's 
served on the board and then she's now served for I think current five years as chair now you're going in you're in your fifth year I believe yes uh, as right. chair. I'm in my fifth year right so uh it, we're we're really really thrilled uh to have you uh with us today and and sort of give us an update on where you are and how you all are going forward well Bob thank you so much and what great slides. I'd like to uh, have those actually, because I want to adopt yeah, several of them in, a pre in the, my general presentation that I give on how important Metro is. But when you talk about Metro being Central Houston family, we feel very much the same way about Central Houston. Um, we're, we've been partners in everything. When I first got on the board in, I, I, I served for four years on the board under Mayor Parker first before Mayor Turner brought me back as chair. And there's this Bible of the formation of Metro. It's this book in great detail um, about how Metro is going to work. And it formed the basis for the 1978 referendum that created Metro. And I come to find out a principal author of that book was I, I was talking about it one time to Bob Yuri. Did you know this? I said, oh, I wrote that. <laughs> like, oh. <laughs> so Bob, in, in some ways, I hope you don't object to the term godfather of Metro. <laughs> anyway, the book was so persuasive that, uh, um, th that we did get Metro passed. And Metro is a creature of, of statute and referendum, as most of you may know. So let me just run through my slideshow and then open it up to questions um, about who we are just as a refresher course and then what we're doing in the face of this pandemic. Um, well, I, I first want to recognize uh, the fact that for the second year in five years or six years, we have received the 2020 Outstanding Public Transportation System Award from the American Public Transportation Association. And that is the most prestigious award in the country. And we're very proud of that. It's really a reflection of Tom Lambert and his team uh, that we've been recognized this way. But I just definitely wanted to brag on the team and thank them for all their hard work. Now, just to give you a brief refresher on Metro, and we can go to the next slide, Reese. Um, most of you know this, but when I got to the board in the first time around, I realized how few people know the nuts and bolts of Metro. And so I normally, in a presentation, start with just a refresher course, and I'll do that today. Just to refresh everybody's recollection, um, Metro service area is 1,303 square miles. Uh, we cover 3.6 million people, probably more by now, um, probably closer to 3.8 million. It's an old figure. And not only do we encompass Houston, but we encompass 14 smaller cities that are in our service area that are listed on the left. And then we have the Western and Northern parts of Harris County, which are in green. We do not have the Eastern part in general because when Metro was formed in 1978, uh, blocks of the county could opt in or opt out. And for various reasons, it made the most sense back then for the Eastern County not to be in Metro, but for the Western County to join. And so that's what happened. Now we have some interest in the Eastern part of the county to join Metro. Um, and so we're looking at that. Okay, you can go to the next slide, Reese. Okay, and we have 4,100 employees. We have about a 14 person executive team. I'm proud to say that our workforce is very diverse. Um, okay, go ahead. And then of course, we break it down between all sorts of different services. We have our local bus service, uh, Metro Rail, our park and ride service from the suburbs, which is, is, is the uh, transporter of the 40% that Bob was talking about for 10 miles over. And then a lot of people don't realize that we have 540 van pools in normal times, not only in Harris County that we facilitate, 
but beyond. And then of course, one of our most important missions, our MetroLift service, portal to portal service for our differently abled community. And um, in normal times, the, the last time uh, we weren't in a pandemic that we measured the ridership we were giving 116 miles, excuse me, 116 million rides uh, in that year. During the pandemic, obviously, uh, Reese, go back if you would. Uh, during the pandemic, um, the ridership has, has dropped precipitously, and we'll talk about more, but that more in a minute. However, the, we still give 80 million rides year and so that tells you that even in a time where people are being discouraged from taking essential trips and I believe we're largely following that um, and you know people are working remotely we nonetheless enough people rely on us that we give 80 million rides a year okay next slide okay and just to refresh you on how we're funded it's primarily not the fare box we are tied with the lowest fares in the country that's a board policy and it's one that i think is important but we are funded with one cent of the sales tax pursuant to that referendum that bob yuri wrote many many years ago and then uh custom and contracts actually over the years have resulted in 25% of that cent being rebated to the city of Houston, the smaller cities in the service area, and to the county that's in the service area for their own discretionary road projects or other projects that relate to mobility like stoplights or anything like that. And that's called the General Mobility Program. And we've rebated over four billion since its inception. Next slide. Okay, and then this is our sources of revenue for fiscal year 2021. Again, in normal times, we'd have a higher budget. We'd have about a billion five, a billion six. However, the way we've been hurt is less fare box revenue because our fares are so low, but sales tax revenue that's gone down because of the band pandemic, less than we thought it would, but nonetheless, it has gone down. So as you can see, the sales tax um, has gone down and that's where we are, are getting nicked. But we've been fortunate because first of all, Metro's always had really strong reserves. And yet we have 15% of our operating budget plus another 10% as a cushion plus $10 million. And in a situation where Harvey hits or a pandemic hits, it's a really, really helpful cushion. One thing that's helped us this year is the CARES Act on the national level came through with some money that kept us from being hurt as badly as we would have been. Okay, next slide. This gives you a, a breakdown on our services and what our, for fiscal year 2020, which was uh, the first year of the pandemic. Normally, local service on the buses would be a lot higher than this, um, park and ride, obviously, but this is what it is for this particular year. Hold on, I apologize here. Let me uh, figure out how to, and, and, and our ridership numbers are not a guesstimate. We actually have what I would call from the old days, electronic eyes. They're automatic passenger counters that as you get in the vehicles and get off, they count you. And then we also have humans ride the system and calibrate the ridership to make sure that our, our numbers are accurate. Okay, next slide. So let's talk for a minute about the impact of COVID-19, and Bob touched on this, on our system and everything that we're doing to try to prevent transmission on our system. Um, we're still giving 130,000 rides every weekday, down from 250 in normal times, but we're still giving 130,000 rides, many of them to the med center so that people can get to their jobs. Uh, in the med center, which has never been more important. Our local bus is down slightly more than half, but our park and ride is down 86%. And that's largely because, as Bob mentioned, 
employers downtown have implemented policies where they're working from home. And so it's been the chicken and egg situation. We keep in close touch with Houston, Central Houston and Bob, he keeps in close touch with us and we're trying to harmonize our service with what employers downtown are doing um, so that when the businesses come back, we'll be fully ready to do it. And until then, uh, we have vastly scaled back service. Metro Rail is down a little more than half. Metro Lyft is down, but we're still giving 3,000 or more rides daily. And that's just, in, those are the people that are just utterly reliant on public transportation. Okay, next slide, please. Um, so one of the, we've adopted the policy of uh, providing, we, we are an essential service um, according to the criteria uh, by the CDC. And so essentially what we're doing is getting essential workers to essential jobs, access to essential places and encouraging only essential trips. Next slide. Now, ever since March, when everybody first realized what a terrible problem this was, um, we have been laser focused on safety and doing everything we possibly can to prevent transmission on our system. Not only do we follow the CDC guidelines, but as you recall, at one point, the Trump administration um, allegedly pressured the CDC to, to water down its guidelines. And we went ahead with the original guidelines the things they would have issued had they not been under pressure. Um, we've, we've, let's go to the next slide. So we started out by encouraging masks before really it was clear that it was a, an important CDC guideline. However, we recognize that it simply made common sense that having cotton, tightly woven cotton between your um, mouth and the public um, or vice versa, because really it's our employees that are at great risk or were at first, um, is, is just common sense. So we immediately began uh, or lining up a supply of masks so that we could provide them to people getting on our system that didn't have them. And actually we had very few incidents of people that didn't want to wear them. People were very cooperative. cooperative. I mean, to me, it's right out of the Bible, love your neighbor as yourself, wear a mask, don't infect somebody else. And in general, our riders saw that. Now we do have a mask mandate. At first, it didn't look like it was legal to mandate it. Governor Abbott had an, an order out there about um, not being able to mandate masks. But once he changed that and allowed businesses to mandate masks, well, then we followed suit. Okay, next. We have stepped up cleaning, obviously, all the most frequently touched surfaces are cleaned multiple times a day. We have sanitizers for the vehicles and facilities. Um, we reduced the vehicle capacity so that we, you could socially distance and we marked where you could sit. And on frequently traveled routes, of course, that led to overflow because you could only sit six feet apart and you had to be at least six feet back from the bus driver. And by the way, in that regard, we initially implemented rear door boarding and forwent fares altogether, which are paid at the front because uh, we wanted people to come in, go as far as they could, stay back from the, from the, from the uh, driver. We had it blocked off past which they could go. And we didn't want them to have to come in and pass everybody else at the fare box. So at first we did that. Now we have reinstated fares because not having fares created its own problem of uh, um, what do you call them, Tom? Riders that what is the what is the term that we use? Non-destination non-destination non riders. Yeah, non-destination riders many of them homeless, um, simply riding the system just to get off the street. And that was actually creating its own problem. So 
we went back to fares, but we uh, now have shields around driver's seats. And of course, plexiglass shields. It's very hard to be infected. Next slide. And then um, we disseminate our safety guidelines system wide. We have safety announcements on the platforms. We have a COVID page on the website with all the best information. From the outset, we of course encouraged people that either had been tested positive for COVID or had any of the symptoms of COVID to stay home. Um, We've had, gosh, over 200 in our workforce test positive for COVID. Some of those had contact with the public, some did not. I still think it's virtually, what, what you see in our tests is that when there's a spike in the community, the spike in our workforce it, it occurs as well. When things are calm in the community and there are very few cases, we have very few cases. So it's an absolute reflection of what's going on in the community. And I believe, I've become convinced um, that it is very hard to get COVID on our system, given all the precautions that we have. You just frankly, you know, with the drivers behind plexiglass, everybody wearing masks, social distancing being enforced, extra sanitation being enforced, um, it's almost impossible to get it. Where we think people get it is out there in the community at large as everybody else is getting it. So we also are very transparent about communicating. If somebody with public facing responsibility like a bus operator does test positive, well, we, we have a press release about that and we detail the routes that they've driven in the last two weeks during the COVID infection period. And um, so, that, so that people can monitor that and self-isolate. Next. As you arrive at work, and this has been going on for months, your temperature is taken. And then we also have a, a poster at each of the work sites that um, lists the symptoms. And not only do you have to have your temperature taken, you have to at attest that you don't have any of those symptoms. Okay, next slide. And let's see, this kind of says it all. Um, Tom, why don't you elaborate on these last three bullet points here? Because um, I think those are very interesting. UV lights in the air systems and the filters being hospital grade, those are relatively new. Do, do you have some things, anything to say about that? I would just say that one of the things we've continuously done under uh, the steps we've taken during the pandemic is looking at best practices. So we looked at what others were doing with UV lighting systems to make sure the HGAC, our HVAC systems uh, that we put in steps to make sure we mitigated uh, any exposure. So all these steps have been taken, learning from best practices, not only here locally, but across the country and internationally. And we wanted to make sure we built confidence of not only uh, our customers that use our service, but the employees that operate the service, that we were doing everything we could to mitigate any exposure. And these are just additional measures that we've taken as part of our best practice review. Okay, great, great. Suffice it to say, if there's anything out there that anybody's doing that is something we, we find out about and we could be doing, we do it. And we're in very frequent contact with other transit agencies as to the best practices. Um, we actually kind of led the way, if I do say so myself, in March on a lot of the things we were doing, including encouraging people to mask up. So I view us as having been under Tom's leadership, a great leader in this initiative. Next slide, please. Um, this is, you know, at the agency and in workplaces, we also encourage social distancing. Um, we're limiting the capacity on each floor, et cetera. Next slide. Now, 
this was what I mentioned in terms of our, the monetary hit to us. Uh, of course, we've had fair revenue loss, but that's of less significance. We've had sales tax revenue loss, um, but we did get almost $250 million in CARES Act funding, and that was really, really helpful. And I hope that as Congress considers another stimulus um, and as President Biden considers an infrastructure bill that we will also benefit from that as well. Next slide. So these bullet points are self-explanatory, but basically never has the necessity of Metro in our community been more underscored than during this pandemic because a lot of people simply rely on it and must take it even in a time like this. And in fact, one third of the Texas Medical Center workers rely on Metro. Next slide, please. Oh, and we've also been partnering with the community um, to in any ways that we can, for example, delivering slides and uh, delivering supplies and personal protective equipment. Next. Okay, so now let me turn and uh, let me pivot to kind of what's going on now. Many of you, and we, we are so thankful to Central Houston under Bob's leadership, but to all of you who dipped into your wallets and contributed to passage of the referendum for Metronex, which passed by almost 70% of the vote. That's our $7.5 billion transit plan to be implemented over uh, 20 years with uh, 40 projects um, over 20 years and we are just over the moon about finally being able to expand our system for the first meaningful time since 2004 when the okay, we uh, money started being issued for the first plan. So first of all, as you know, um, we've implemented the silver line, which is in Uptown. I always underline that the Uptown BRT construction was not a Metro project. I know it was a huge pain in the neck and everybody suffered greatly, particularly everybody that lives out West. And uh, we, that was not our project. It was a project of the Uptown Management District. We, our role is to buy the buses and operate the system. That having been said though, we think it's gonna be a great project and we're already getting so much positive input on our silver line. How many uh, folks did we decide that carried a day, Tom? The number uh, again, is seven it's about over 700 riders a day. And again, we've been pushing the essential trip message as well. Yeah, yeah. So even in these times, we have over 700 riders a day. And just to refresh your recollection, the silver line is exactly in Central Houston's wheelhouse in that what it is really designed to do is facilitate the remote workers from Southwest and Northeast. It's not a shop hopper. It's not getting from, you know, Gucci to Dolce Gabbana or something on the nice stores on Post Oak. What it is, is a way for the employees that come in, although it can be used as a shop hopper, but what it really is, is a way for the employees that come in on those parking rides and get marooned at the transit centers um, at I-10 West to actually be able to bypass that most congested roadway in the state, now number two, according to the Chronicle, and get into their workplaces by, for example, from the Northeast, transferring at the Northwest Transit Center, and then getting on our, our Uptown BRT and going down into Posto. And so it's actually designed to benefit um, the workers in that area, just as the park and rides 
benefit the workers downtown. And also Northwest Transit Center into downtown BRT, which is something we're already working on, is gonna, I think, be a great boon for downtown businesses as well. So that gives you a little information on the silver line. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, now this is the moving forward plan that was passed in the referendum. Um, you see 75 miles of bus rapid transit known as rail on rubber where really souped up buses go along in dedicated lanes as rail would, but you don't have those ugly catenary wires that sometimes bust and cause a problem. And it, it really is the great new thing in the country and we're on the vanguard of it. The post Oak BRT, the Uptown BRT, or Metro Rapid as we call it, I think that was Bob Urie's name for it, wasn't it, Bob? I'm not sure. But at any rate, um, we that is going to be the model um, for the country, and we're going to have that everywhere instead of rail, and it turns out to be one third to one half the cost of rail, so we can do much more, go much further, and the service is comparable. So to the left here is just an itemization of the different projects we have in the moving forward plan. They're shown on the map. Uh, we do have a little bit more rail. We do where it makes sense, where we already have a rail line and we can leverage off of that to expand its efficiency. We take it up to the North Shepherd Park and Ride. We go down to Hobby Airport. Um, we have a little tiny bit for $19 million. It's going to go to the courthouse from the from uh, one of the lines. But in general, we double down on bus rapid transit and max lanes, another Bob Urey concept along with Tori Gaddis about having these wonderful special HOV lanes that service our park and rides now and are even further enhanced. And then of course, we have what's known as boost corridors, improvements to existing bus service that vastly improve its efficiency. And then also just all manner of services, including a very, very important initiative for Metro, which is making sure our stops and our facilities are purely accessible to our differently abled community. Okay, let's go to the next slide. You all are guinea pigs, I apologize for this. This is the first time I've done this with this slideshow. So if you're seeing some fits and starts and halting speaking on my part, that's why. <laughs> next time it'll go more smoothly. Um, so let's start with the boost care, the boost corridors. Um, the mantra of boost is a better walk. Well, let me just start with, here's what we can do. Obviously the pandemic has caused us to take a second look at Metro Next in a number of ways. First of all, we have to figure out what we can do within our budget in a reasonable time frame over the next two or three years in light of the pandemic's diminution of our sales tax. Because even issuing bonds, which is what the referendum authorizes us to do in the tune of three and a half billion over 20 years, obviously we're not gonna issue all that at once, only as it's financially feasible. But even the issuance of bonds rests on having sales taxes to back them up as collateral. So, uh, Everything slowed down a little bit, but we are able to do several things immediately. We are moving forward with Metro Next, and two of the things we're doing are two boost corridors. And let's just go to the next slide. What, Tom, why don't you describe what a boost corridor is? Um, basically, what it is is you take these, these enhancements, like, for example, it's much more efficient for buses to go through an intersection and for the stop to be on the far side of an intersection, to have signal priority in certain instances. There are just various things you can do that vastly streamline the efficiency of your normal bus service. And that's a part of Metro Next. Do you have any additional uh, information on that, Tom? Madam Chair, I think you hit it on. The other thing it will do is as, as we get priority treatment and we connect to the traffic signal, we can also put information posts of when the next bus is going to arrive at that stop. 
and it's really making the customer experience better, adding amenities that uh, improve the customer safety, security, all the features associated with that, and then getting a more reliable, more frequent service that allows people to, to get confidence that service will get there when it needs to get there. So, Madam Chair, I think you hit it all. Okay. So the first boost corridors are 56 airline Montrose and 54 Scott. These are existing bus routes that we're simply going to enhance. And you can see the bus routes there. Um, and we are moving forward on those. And when do you predict we'll have those, Tom, fully implemented? We're probably about 18 months away. Uh, we're, we've got contracts in place. We're going to do a pilot program on the 56 airline that you'll see it up sooner, uh, but we're about 18 months away of moving those. And I want to also thank Commissioner Ellis from Precinct 1. Uh, he's been a very active partner with us as well as City of Houston Public Works and Planning. Yes. C Commissioner Ellis uses part of his budget to help us with these things, and it is really helpful. Uh, next slide, please. So this will just give you what, okay, something happened to the slide on my end. Is the slide still up there? Yes, ma'am, the slide's still up on the, on the big screen. Okay, well, let me turn to, I can't see it. What it, what it reflects is the ADA universal accessibility, improving the stops, safe pedestrian crossings, improved sidewalks, and the okay. things we, we why, talked why about. Why can't I see it? That would be helpful if I could, if somebody could figure that out. Uh, hold on, let me see if, I apologize. Normally, and I'm sure it's on me, this goes a lot more seamlessly. Yeah, I don't have it. Well, all right. Okay. Um, so this is self-explanatory. And then our a universal accessibility initiative is something I'm very proud of. We started this several years ago. And as you may know, Dr. Lex Frieden is on our board, appointed by Mayor Turner. And Lex is in a wheelchair. He was in an accident as a young man. And he is, is, was a principal author, if not the author, of the Americans with Disabilities Act. And his great friend, President George H.W. Bush, signed it into law. So Lex has been a really, really important advocate for years for uh, that community. And boy, I had no idea until seeing the world through Lex's eyes and a few instances of, of the impediments um, to just having the most any disability whatsoever. And so we at Metro have made it a priority. And Lex Frieden and Sanjay Ram, who's an engineer, another one of our excellent directors, and we have a very fine board, are manning a task force with and working with staff to systematically evaluate all of our 9,000 bus stops and systematically make sure that they are accessible, not only in compliance with the ADA, but going beyond that to make sure people really can get to them, whether the slab is technically compliant or not, that you have sidewalks leading up to them. This requires a partnership with Houston Public Works. Um, and we've, how many have we done, Tom, so far? Do you know? Yeah. Yeah, we've done 312 this year. We've got a thou over a thousand designed and with the contracts being let, we will step that up very aggressively in the coming years. Yeah, good, okay. Um, and then let's see, I talked about Metro Rapid. Um, we covered that. Now 29 Metro Rapid in Uptown, 29, slide 29, is the Metro Rapid Intercady. That is another project we're going ahead and embarking on. You may know, I didn't until I was on Metro, that the Houston Galveston Area Council is a very important local body. Um, the Transportation Policy Council aspect of that group, subgroup on which I serve and Judge Hidalgo serves and Commissioner Garcia and some of the city council members and then a whole lot of folks from the surrounding area, uh, many of them from the rural areas. 
serve on this. And it's what's known as the Metropolitan Planning Organization for purposes of federal money. It's in the statute, it is the MPO. So if you want federal money, you have to go through HGAC and your project has to be blessed by HGAC, unless it comes from, there are certain pots of federal money that you wouldn't have to go through HGAC. But in general, if you want federal money, um, it's a good thing to go through HGAC. And we have gotten a grant of federal money through HGAC toward the Metro Rapid Inner Katy. That helped, that actually happened even before passage of the referendum, even though this is a project in the referendum and requires us to match it, match the federal money to some extent. So we're able to go ahead with this. So as you can see, on the map, um, what this will do is bring an uptown style rapid transit from the Northwest Transit Center all the way into downtown. And then once the uh, Texas Central Railway is constructed, it will tie in to that too. We'll go ahead and extend. And this gives you uh, on, on slide 30, um, these are the advantages of this. You can see, you know, what I explained and um, it closes the HOV lane gap on I-10, which is another advantage. And you have better regional express park and ride, but regional express is what we're calling it now service. And then we're going ahead and if you would slide 31 race. Um, you're very familiar with the concept of the university line, which was very, very controversial for many years in the 1990s. And the way the university line, which I think is one of the essential corridors we have to connect, was originally envisioned, it was going to be a rail line going from downtown to Hillcroft, out Richmond, through Afton Oaks, uh, and that caused a great deal of controversy for a lot of different reasons. One was that it was perceived that rail was very expensive. Two, it was going to disrupt a neighborhood and the, the residents didn't want it. So it never happened for a variety of reasons. Um, we had an elected official determined to block it. He's no longer there. Um, in his place, we have a wonderfully pro-transit whip smart Congresswoman Lizzie Fletcher, who is, has been a phenomenal ally for us up in Washington and for a lot of important things in Houston. But now we have converted that in the referendum to a uh, Metro rapid line, bus rapid transit. And not only does it go from downtown to Hillcroft, first of all, it doesn't go through Afton Oaks, it jogs down on Edlow, at least that's the current plan. Uh, as to where it will jog down. It will jog down somewhere. Jog down at Edlow, go to West Park, and go out to West Chase instead of just stopping at Hillcroft, which the rail line was supposed to do. So it goes farther, and furthermore, it can wind up and around up to the Tidwell Transit Center. So we get much more bang for the buck for less money um, maybe the same amount of money overall since, you know, we're going a lot farther, but much more efficient than rail. And we're going to be able to serve many, many more destinations. And I think it's going to be comparable service. So it's a 25, next slide, please, a 25 mile corridor. And um, obviously it will link the major employment and activity centers, um, including UHTSU, Greenway Plaza, Uptown and West Chase. And the great thing too, both the inner Katy, uh, uh, Metro Rapid going into downtown and this one will coordinate with the Uptown Metro Rapid. So you're essentially gonna have like this loop of bus rapid transit as you might have with a rail line um, with the Metro Next plan. Okay, well, that is the end of my slideshow. And I appreciate your indulgence as I sort of stumbled through it. Normally we're a little bit more seamless than this, uh, but um, 
let me open the floor to any questions. Yeah. I think the best way to do it at this point is probably just for you and the audience to speak up. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. Any uh, I think Lonnie Hogeboom has one. It's put it into chat uh, on the boost services uh, uh, discussion of by Metro of improvements on downtown corridors. Uh, Smith, Louisiana, Milam, Travis, San Jacinta, what's proposed and when. Um, I know there has been conversations of how do we make, uh, especially park and ride, more efficient in downtown, quicker, more efficient. And uh, any any questions, I mean, any, any way you can answer that, um, either Karen or, or Tom. Sidewalks are in the plan. I noticed Nicole Adler put that in chat. And yes, sidewalks are part of the plan where necessary to access the stops. And you know, uh, we build a lot of sidewalks. It, first of all, obviously, sidewalks are generally the portfolio of public works and we work very closely with the city now to try to get sidewalks where we need them sometimes if the process is too slow we just step in and build them ourselves um, we work with the commissioners to try to get their help in building sidewalks in various parts of harris county like commissioner ellis but others as well um, um, Steve Raddick was helpful to us on some of the construction we needed to do, and I anticipate that Commissioner Ramsey, who's actually a mayor of one of, or was a mayor of one of our smaller cities and so is familiar with Metro, will be uh, helpful in that way too. They all really have been in one way or another, but yes, sidewalks are part of the overall Metro Next vision. Um, and what was the other question? I guess I missed that. Well, yeah, I, I, I know that there have been discussions uh, with Metro, and I think we're getting ready to resume those discussions uh, about a modification. Let me just start with this one about modifications to Capital Rusk to make it a little less uh, disorienting to drivers and safer by actually having drivers not be in the lane that the L light rail vehicles are in on Capital yes. Rusk. Yes. Anything you want to ask on that? We feel, I think we all agree it's a good time to do this right now if we're going to do right. it. <laughs> right. Uh, and then uh, I, uh, Rally Problete is uh, from Gensler. Uh, we've got, uh, uh, he asked a question here. Uh, could you repeat again the timeline for the university bus rapid transit line? Sort of how does that play out time wise? Yeah. Yeah, it's going to be everything in transit time is is protracted um, in the world of transit. The first thing you have to do is, of course, uh, work on your engineering and environmental, and that takes so what we're what we're allocating money. And correct me if I'm misstating anything, Tom. What we're allocating money for right up front now is getting started on the environmental for that corridor, because unfortunately not only is the layout somewhat different than it was in 2003, even for rail, um, all of that work is obsolete. It's just way, way, way too far in the back, in the rear view mirror. So we're gonna have to start over with the environmental and we'll start doing that work on the university quarter. And it's gonna be at least, I would say five years before we break ground on any of that. Um, as Bob well knows, given the federal process, there's just so many steps, but we do want to go ahead and get the environmental started so that we can get in the grant line. We can put in for a grant uh, because it takes a long time in the federal process to get improved, approved for a grant. The way it works is you, let, let's take the, um, the rail lines, the, the red line was built with local funds, but the green line and the purple line, the green line goes out east, the purple line goes southwest. Um, you, we got federal grants to match our local contribution for those lines. And you submit all manner of documentation. They question it, they scrub it. They make sure that the project is a feasible one. Um, you have to do an alternatives analysis. What would it cost to do nothing? And what would happen if you did nothing? And why? therefore, why is it so necessary to do this? 
And then they want you to look at other alternatives to the configurations. Uh, what we had happen with the university line is the elected official at that time that was kind of obsessed with stopping it uh, would keep coming up with these alternatives analyses. Well, we want you to look at X, we want you to look at Y. And so it just mired the process down. I don't think that'll happen this time, but it is a painful process. And I myself, back in the day when I was on the board before with Tom and others, have directly met with the FTA administrator. Um, and then when you get the grant, it's a glorious day. They, they scrub it all and then they say, guess what? Here's 450 million, let's sign a deal. So we're trying to get to where now that it does look like an administration will put forth an infrastructure bill and that it will include money for public transportation. Um, we're trying to get our, our ducks in a row so that we can immediately get in that grant process and start advocating with our elected officials and and others and start doing all the work to ultimately get the money in. Uh, we have another question. Thank you. And we have another question here uh, from Jacob Lipp at uh, uh, University of Houston downtown. Uh, when we would we might expect an inner Katy uh, Metro Rapid Corridor to open? Obviously, for U of H downtown, that's pretty good. That's that's, that's a good important. thing. It is. Yeah. When would you say, Tom? Well, the, what we expect right now is the environmental clearance. We expect that to be about 18 months, and we've already got a contractor in place, and we're moving that forward. Uh, we will then get into final design, which will take about 12 months after the environmental clearance, and we expect construction to begin in 2023, 2024. So that's kind of the timeline we're at now, but we've just uh, gotten very active in the environmental process, so we'll keep everybody posted on where we're going with that. Yeah. Let me add another question from Jacob too, and that is, uh, how will there be stations, and sort of how would the stations work uh, on the on that new connection? The, the, Which, yeah, Madam Chair, if you will, there there are plans to do inline stations along the corridor. Of course, connecting the Northwest Transit Center, uh, we're looking at a stop at uh, in the general area of Shepherd's uh, Durham in that area. Another stop that feeds in prior to the using the. Uh, the existing uh, downtown connector ramp. The other great opportunity for this corridor is the type of vehicles that the board and their vision, we have five doors to these rapid transit buses, these rapid transit vehicles. So our intent is we think we can also run these uh, rapid transit vehicles in line with the rail service coming through downtown as well. So we think there's some great opportunity to really improve uh, the type of services down the inner Katy BRT quarter, but also connecting them to the existing rail lines on Capitol and Russ. So uh, we look forward to that and think it's a great opportunity. And I want to compliment the chair and the board for having that vision to say, let's go to five door buses. We have doors on both sides. Yeah. Well, it's an interesting point. Um, the buses, and if you've ridden them on Uptown Rapid, are more reminiscent of rail cars. And Tom's point is that you have doors on each side of the bus and they open like rail cars and they're flush with a platform. And so you can, uh, not only are they completely flexible, I mean, if you need to, you can use them like ordinary buses as long as you have some infrastructure to keep the platforms level. Um, but yeah, you can interline them that way. So good point. I'm going to I'm going to finish up with one question here, uh, and I'm going to kind of bring us back from these future plans, which are very exciting. It's actually kind of takes you away from COVID when you start thinking about that. Uh, one, I just want to give a shout out to that. You, you, you've given me personally way too much credit, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, there's this think tank that uh, it's Central Houston's Transportation Committee that has been where the really good ideas come from. And I just want to acknowledge them because I know members are on the this in this with us this morning in the meeting. Thank you, I thank you, and I know many of them, and um, I'm very uh, very appreciative for all your ideas and in context of Metronex and other things. Yeah, I want to. Uh, I I think one of the questions it, it's there, and it's a little bit more immediate to the present uh, present because we mentioned it at the beginning. We're really in this chicken or egg, uh, Madam you, Chair. You said it. We know we're in this chicken or egg situation. Who could, we got to come back, but then is Metro ready for us to come? You know what I mean? We're back and forth here in terms of 
how we come back to whatever the new normal is on this thing. Uh, and I, just a stat, just so everybody knows, we're running at about 16% of the workforce uh, in downtown office workforce down at present right now. So we got a long way to go to get back. Uh, and, and so um, I don't think that's gonna happen real soon. It's gonna take a while here for that to really happen. Uh, Louis Rosenthal asked a question about, uh, you know, kind of what you're all thinking on the continued cleaning and uh, uh, things after vaccine, you know, kind of, you know, this, this issue. I think the issue, Louis, is probably one of building and continuing confidence, so to speak, in safety, uh, your safe, you know, health safety with it. So I would throw that to you, uh, Madam Chair, or Tom, either one. Yeah, well, let's let's throw it to Tom, but I feel confident uh, that as a matter of policy, we will, we will continue that for a good long time. I mean, first of all, you have to make sure the vaccine's truly effective, and it sounds like it's going to be. Uh, but second, now that we've gotten in the habit of doing all of that, you know, what's the downside? So Tom, what would you say about that? Madam Chair, you, you hit it right on the head. I think it's now part of our core business. I don't think we're gonna waver off of that. I think it continues yeah. to build confidence, not only of our customers and the general community, but quite frankly, supporting our colleagues that are operating that service. But I wanna make one point, before we even got into the pandemic, the Metro Board had already increased funding for cleaning of stops and platforms. This was not something that uh, was new to us. You had seen over the past several years a real focus on that customer experience. And what we heard very actively from our customers is we wanted more cleaning. We wanted to feel more comfortable. So historically, we've been driving that. And I think that is part of our core business, part of our core mission now. Uh, and so I, I expect, as the chair said, it will continue. You know, I'm seeing here some questions from Lonnie uh, about the university line and it, it just, I don't know, we probably ought to make sure to get back to people. We will, we will on, on some of these, I, I'm just uh, here. Yeah, I I, I, Tom, I, I, Tom's the one actually, and I know he would be happy to call uh, Lonnie and others. Oh, call Lonnie. Him. And then, uh, uh, and I guess there's one remaining one from uh, Joe uh, Hughes. Uh, and that is related to uh, uh, collaboration, basically on the linkage with the new high-speed rail. And uh, I, I think we've had positive news recently here. So this could, and I hope it is a reality, so. Uh, well, I, you know, we are gonna connect to it, uh, but Tom, do you have anything to add to that? Let me just say, yes, we've been coordinating with Texas Central Railway. We've also been coordinating with the city of Houston uh, who, who I think everybody knows, established, Mayor Turner established a memorandum of understanding of how everyone would work with Texas Central Railway. We've been doing a lot of pre-planning with them. Now that they're moving forward, uh, I think with their federal clearances, we'll see a lot more focus on what those really next steps need to be. So we look forward to that as well. Good. Well, listen, let me uh, thank you again, Madam Chair, for one, being with us this morning, but really also for your great leadership oh, uh, in, wow. in these times. Uh, and uh, uh, Tom, uh, Chief, to you too, uh, for um, your lead of the agency here uh, in these very, very difficult times. Uh, we are, we're with you all the way. I know we've got a meeting coming up, the Transportation Committee, to actually talk about some of these things that we've been talking about here. Uh, so, you know, it's time to roll up our sleeves. We've always had our sleeves rolled up, but uh, it's also maybe if we can begin to get COVID in the rear view mirror, then the excitement of really being able to go forward into the future. So we're looking forward to it. One thing I might mention to you just before I jump off, we have over a billion and a half dollars worth of construction going on in downtown and over almost 20 projects. And, you know, the fact is, is the downtown that folks return to is going to be a very different downtown. That were in a sense what they left and um so we're excited about it and and i think people will be excited about it as, as we all come back so uh thank you again to you all for your participation and to our members who participated here today we hope everybody has a really good and safe holiday season so thanks
Thank you all so much for your support of Metro and not only with helping us get the referendum passed, but all the good ideas. Fortunately, we have such a good collaborative relationship. And one thing that we that will be very important to us is your knowledge uh, and thinking as to when your employees are coming back to work, um, because we do want to move in sync with that and make sure that we're providing the service that you need. But but there's no group more important to our region than you all. And so thank you so very much for all your support of our, our great greater Houston. Thank you. Thank you to all. Have a good morning.